Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Noura Al Amr. I'll be moderating today's session on green planets and green events. Um, we will be joined by Tara Benny um, online. So let's just, is she online? Is she here? Hi, Tara. Hi, so, Noura. Hi, hello. guys. Great. So now that the technicalities are all smoothed over, um, welcome to today's session. Um, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and in a world impacted by climate change, we're seeing the rise of music festivals back again. And um, maybe this time we need to do them a bit differently. So today we have uh, Linnea Svensson, who is a pioneer in sustainable events in Norway, where she was pivotal since 2002 uh, with the Norwegian Oya Festival, which is the biggest festival in Norway. And, um, and she has also created a green roadmap for events. Um, and we would love to hear from her. We also have Tara on, uh, online. So Tara uh, pushes the boundaries of festivals as a platform for positive cultural and environment ch environmental change as a co-founder of the Strawberry Fields Festival in the Australian bush. So it would be really fantastic to hear more from Tara later this, this uh, afternoon. And uh, we also have Princess Mashal El Shalan, who is the co-founder of Aeon Strategy and Collective, who advises on climate policy, climate change, um, energy policy. Um, so she'll give us more of the global context in all of the discussions today. Um, so I'm going to kickstart this session and just throw my anchor. Um, this, the format of the session is more of a reaction panel, so it's more of a discussion, uh, more of a conversation, um, and um, I'll, help, I'll help moderate that. So um, let's start with this. So it's not surprising that music festivals are the first movers in the, in, in, in the industry when it comes to, comes to sustainability, just because of the general feel of music festival goers and the kind of sustainable values and you know, vibrations and rhythms that you see in music festivals. So, um, Linnea and Tara, could you take us through what it's, just the practical aspects of organizing a sustainable event um, and how that goes? Okay, I'm just gonna jump in, Tara, and you will, uh, you can uh, interrupt me at any time. Uh, I guess we have uh, a bit of different experiences. So good to be here, thank you yeah. for hosting this. Um, <clears throat> well, so, uh, first of all, I think it's very important to have uh, a motivation that you have some kind of vision and aim for what you want to achieve. And uh, I, I think that goes for all kinds of transition and change. Yeah. So, um, and then you have to know what to change. So having somebody in charge of the area, having the resources and the mandate to, to develop a program around this, that's a good way to start. But also to start mapping your whole event and your footprint in different areas to find where do I have the biggest impact that is negative and how can we change it? And then you have to start to involve stakeholders. So yeah. that's kind of a starting point, I would say, like start, of course, start by starting, <laughs> like where do yeah. I start, you have to start. And then a good way is to look through your books to your invoices, like how do I spend my money and how can I source that differently and how can I organize differently? So Tara, uh, what do you think? Am I onto something here? I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do have have the feeling that you know what you're talking about there, Lydia. Thank you. Um, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that your suggestion to start by looking for the biggest levers, like the biggest buckets within an event that you can change, makes sense um, if you're trying to introduce change. But uh, I suppose in addition to that, one of the ways that we try and look at sustainability is not just as a discrete set of, you know, initiatives or ideas within an event, but rather like a cohesive planning approach to designing any event. Because the way that we look at it, um, it actually is sort of a uniting um, framework for event design. 
like whether all you care about is marketing and having really happy attendees and and really great um, sort of promotion and and advocacy for your event, you're going to benefit from having a clean and and enjoyable event. You know, if you care mainly about the financial impact of a event or a festival, sustainable design done well will most often be the most cost-effective approach as well. And particularly if you're an event like ours, which is in quite a remote location, three and a half hours from, from the nearest major city, a sustainable approach is also going to be the most effective use of the resources you have, you know, minimizing the amount of water that you need delivered or trash that you need removed is, is just going to make your event design more effective. So we really just try and use it as a, a way of thinking to make the overall event um, the best outcome from any perspective. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Tara. Um, and totally, it makes being sustainable is actually being sensible and using your resources is, when you dive deep into it, is a natural way of being. And, um, and thank you for that. So we'll turn to Michelle and maybe some reflections on what we've heard. Yeah, um, I mean, I come at it more from a perspective of policy, so it might be a bit zoomed out compared to the work that's happening on the event level. Um, I also come at it from a climate change perspective. So when I think of climate, I think of the atmosphere. And when I think of the atmosphere, I think of action that's happening at scale and at action that's happening at the level where the atmosphere cares, right? So it's great to have these kinds of events having some kind of a work from the grounds up, but it needs to be happening in a way that's economic, mm -hmm. where it could be replicable. It has to make sense to the people and the goers. We spoke about COVID, so there's that aspect of health. Yeah. Um, I think minimizing, at least starting with efficiency, for example, of yeah. diesel generators and having cleaner air to breathe would be a huge plus for festival yeah. goers, uh, especially valuing a lot of things post-COVID. Another thing that I was also reflecting on and maybe chatting a bit about with Linnea before coming into this um, was food. Uh, so the perspective, I think, that reminded us as well, post-COVID, that there's value that's associated with organic, clean, locally sourced food. Um, um, you know, all of a sudden, with all of the closures of the borders that happened during COVID, it became some kind of a, uh, an instigator or an initiator of a much bigger deployment of locally sourced organic food. So again, how does that all fit in within the policy landscape? Um, we look at it, again, as people who work in policy at the international level, at the intra-governmental level. So where can we build up harmony between different governments in a way that uh, maximizes the impact of that, uh, the effect of uh, what's happening with what Linnea and others are doing, like Tara in Australia in terms of positive um, kind of um, um, events. If you take that kind of model and you think of it as a way of making the biggest noise or showing the biggest impact, uh, one quick number, if I may, um, for example, in the US, one in 10 people are regular festival goers. So if they see the kind of future that they want to see in this miniature city, let's say, the kind of day-to-day -day life, it becomes much easier as well for the policymaker to push and enact maybe more environmentally friendly policies because there's the kind of buy-in that you have of this different style of living that could be had. I'm not going to dwell too much and maybe I'll give it back to my colleagues, but just to say that uh, from small to the larger scale, there are a lot of other considerations and maybe at some point I can reflect a bit about the Saudi experience, this blank slate that we have here and the opportunity to create something that's come kind of a leapfrog uh, yeah. um, uh, and exercise as well with the kind of government backing that allows us to do things maybe in a way and in a scale that has not been done before in other geographies. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in. Sorry, Nora. Uh, I think what you're saying is really crucial. Uh, to understand opportunities that we have with creating events and festivals, that it can be, you know, uh, areas where you can test, it, the festivals are test beds where you really can um, uh, work together with the society and with the infrastructure and see how things can be developed further. And when we started with a festival in, in Oslo, the Aya festival, uh, there was no waste separation in the municipality, but we were able to start separating the waste. And after a while, 
the municipality got on board and made a campaign about waste sorting at the festival in Oslo because so many of the inhabitants were coming to the festival. Could and I ask it was when that was? Sorry? What year was that in? Uh, uh, 2009 or something, so quite late. Oslo was late um, with separating its uh, waste. And we had been doing it since 2003 already, so we already built that infrastructure. And then sh showing with the right color labels the, the new system that was being rolled out. And we did the same cooperation with biking in Oslo. It was a big, you know, we always had parking for bikes. Nobody used it. <laughs> and then we got the municipality on board, made this campaign, and suddenly it was like 2,000 bikes. I'm not kidding. It was like all over. And we had like a service going on. It was like being very much introducing these practices, but together with those also offering the infrastructure. Um, so that's why I think there's a lot of uh, meaning uh, uh, putting a festival quite close to a city because it's yeah. a great test bed. Sorry, mm -hmm. Tara. So, <laughs> no, absolutely. I like, yeah. What what both her highness and you are saying, Linnea, really resonate with me. I've always thought of festivals as ephemeral cities, um, especially for us who are working in greenfield. So we're really setting up a city that we have 362 days to prepare for with a blank slate each year. We're not necessarily held to the same design concepts or standards from the previous event. And we have a luxury that most established um, cities uh, don't have, which is that blank slate and opportunity to step back yeah. and, and reset and create some more disruptive initiatives that people can hopefully take home to their daily lives or implement in a in a grander scale and and completely agree with the point her highness made around the policy considerations of that being translatable rely on it being economical um you know in in 2019 we implemented for the first time no single use uh plates cups or bowls throughout our event and because it's a three-day camping festival that's essentially every person's meal for 12,000 people for, for three days <laughs> And um, the logistics of setting up that system were, were challenging, but it was managed to, to be implemented in a way that there was no cost to the patron and there was no cost to us. It was essentially uh, a deposit system that was enabled by cashless RFID wristbands so that people would deposit in and out of using plates, cups and bowls. It was a change in their behavior um, because people had to get used to it. It was enabled by technology. It had safeguards and guardrails around it so that people couldn't abuse the system by just abandoning their responsibility without being charged. And there were also incentives for people to maybe collect the, the plates, cups or bowls of another person who, who was willing to give up their deposit and gain their deposit. So if, for us, that was a really great example of, of designing scalable systems um, that people enjoy to, to participate in, um, but that also kind of have the safeguards that make it make sense financially. So I, I would love to know personally more about um, what initiatives, you know, um, are being looked at at a policy level for, for the country with that sustainability lens, because the scale up moment is really, yeah, really the exciting one. I mean, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'd have to say in, in, in Saudi, it's a bit of a different makeup of a system, uh, just because, well, um, the biggest festivals that are actually happening are, if not government-driven, they're semi-governmental uh, in nature, thus giving us a lot of flexibility to sort of deploy things that might not have been deployable before. I have to say, Linnea, we're even later to that recycling uh, <laughs> uh, ecosystem. So 2019, not, 2009 actually gives us hope that, okay, well, we might be a bit late, but that gives us an opportunity to learn from a lot of what was done on international level, for example, I would... We did uh, many mistakes, believe yeah. me, and still are learning. Yeah, so. uh, the same in the UK, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen what's happening in the UK 
for example, with uh, their pl plastics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the wrong kind of policy incentives, we, you spoke about incentives as well, Tara, um, sort of leads action in the wrong direction. Um, everyone was feeling like they were recycling their plastics. Those plastics ended up being on barges and sent to China, where they were asked to yeah. dispose of it, right? Mm -hmm. So within the UK, the layman was feeling good about doing their own duty, but the policy structure was not sort of pushing for further recycling in country and done at specific high levels of, let's say, environmental um, standards. It was being outsourced somewhere else to the point where China was like, thank you, but no thank you, we don't want your plastics anymore. So yeah. I, I think this gives us a big opportunity to think of how could we frame the right kind of policies for the kingdom. That's, that's in one way when it comes to maybe recycling. Um, I have to say another aspect with which Saudi Arabia made its commitments to neutrality, um, the past few months, I feel like it was years ago, it was a, a difficult birth, at least for, for us who are, who are working and advocating for climate change. Um, a big push and a commitment to carbon neutrality by 2060, but then with uh, you know, uh, the afterthought of saying, in alignment with the circular carbon economy. So sorry for being a bit technical, but maybe I'll give you a bit of an insight of how Saudi thinks of policymaking. Uh, the circular carbon economy is essentially what it sounds like. It's circular economy, but for carbon, and it has four main pillars. The first is the reduce component. So if you think of, um, you know, solar, batteries, energy efficiency, which is extremely important, but maybe not as uh, marketable <laughs> compared to the nice solar panels that could be put, uh, you know, uh, in your back lot, um, is the first component. So you're reducing the amount of carbon that's being emitted. The second is the reuse component. So whatever is being captured is being put into other uses without changing its chemistry. Uh, maybe a simple way of thinking about it could be for pumping CO2 into greenhouses for better production of food. So there you're meeting better targets for food security, but at the same time you're, uh, you know, lessening the impact. Of course, uh, we, we have to evaluate things as well as the shelf life of that mm. carbon. Uh, the other component is the recycle, so you'd be changing the chemistry, essentially turning... Um, you could think of uh, recycling plastics within that bracket, that's one way of thinking about it, maybe changing CO2 into ammonia, um, so that, that's one way of thinking about it. And the most important part, which is the differentiator between the circular economy and the circular carbon economy is the remove component. So we already know that there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere to date. Mm -hmm. uh, we're already way above what is safe in terms of an operating space for humanity. Yes. So the remove component is what allows us to capture carbon that's already into the, in the atmosphere and storing it underground in either olivine formations through carbon mineralization, etc. Basically meaning the onus of innovation and demonstrating and deploying and most importantly to your point, Tara, economizing a lot of these solutions is on Saudi Arabia. So we not only have to talk to the talk, but we have to actually show um, leadership in that front. So I think we have a multitude of things that give us you know, maybe uh, sets of endowments uh, to do game changers. And mm -hmm. honestly, I'm here humble and learning from what's happening within the festival ecosystem. Uh, I love music, I listen to music, but I, I go to concerts, but festivals are not necessarily uh, maybe my scene, maybe uh, because of you know, the relative uh, uh, room that we have. Most of the festival goers are probably having their first cup of coffee right now. I tend to have my first dream by the time that everyone's filling these rooms. Um, so a different <laughs> demographic, but um, I think that's a big opportunity to enact change both on the social level that we're witnessing, that we're feeling in the kingdom, but equally match it with environmental and sort of policy changes as well. Mm. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you for that, Michelle. And just drawing on what everyone was saying, I just want to pull it back a little bit. And, and just when you were talking about the circular carbon economy and all the different things and the econ economic value and the sustainability, anything that's sort of circular, I'm finding, is, is more sustainable. Um, and then when you look at circles in our world, our, our, our our earth is circular, our, the sun is circular. So even just looking at circles in themselves um, gives you a hint to maybe greater things that, that could be achieved um, through, through sustainability. And also just a little reminder as to why we want to think sustainably um, and, this, and the you know, devastating impacts of, that, of climate change and things like the coronavirus pandemic. So I'm interested to hear um, maybe from Linia, maybe we can look at how COVID and the post-COVID world looks like for music festivals. And then, yeah. Um, wow, yeah, well, we are in several challenges. 
uh, like you say, it's, it's COVID that is changing our society. It is the climate change. It's also the you know, decrease of biodiversity and the, just the fact that we are using more raw material and using more of our earth than we have. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Earth Overshoot um, mm -hmm. webpage, you should check it out. You can also map your own footprints, your ecological footprints. But I think, from my perspective, we should use this opportunity to rethink and to not go back to normal, but to, to what do you say, like build back greener. Uh, but it also means more inclusive, I think. And what we saw when we talked to our, our artists around Oslo was, what did you miss most uh, during the pandemic? Was it, did you have financial issues because you couldn't work? or were you ill or were you lonely? What was your impact? And it was the reason that they couldn't meet, they missed their uh, network and their meeting places. That was really important. So it's about mental health as well. It's the human sustainability. So there are several levels. But I really think we need to organize in a different way, being more efficient with our resources and understanding that there are different ways, like you say, um, uh, to capture and to develop and to research, and we need to continue doing that. It's necessary uh, to, to have different ways of reducing the CO2 and to use it as a resource. Um, but I'm very much um, uh, fascinated by Kate Raworth's economics, the donut mm -hmm. economics that you're probably familiar with, with looking into the social foundation creating a space that is just and safe for everyone, but also within the ecological boundaries. Um, so uh, how can you and I and we together do that uh, yeah. in our own ways? Uh, I think we all need to sit down and think like, how can I uh, play a role in this? What role do I have? How can we together make this change, you know? Yeah. And I'll just jump to Tara. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, thanks, Nora. I'm just hearing you speak now, Linnea. I might ask you one more question, <laughs> which I'm interested to know just from one, one event to another, like empowering people to, to want to, to be part of the change um, is obviously like the ideal scenario. But we all know pe people exist on a spectrum and some people are more difficult than others to, to kind of compel and motivate. So what are the ways you, you've been able to design things to, to make them easy, I guess, for people to participate in more sustainable solutions? Like how do we make it easy? Just to make the choices for them, not to make too many options. That's how you do it. <laughs> and basically putting on demands on the stakeholders around you and how you, <laughs> how you involve them. Um, uh, yeah, that's the, e the, the quick answer. But of course you have to have people on board. You need, you know, ambassadors, you need people, uh, you know, they're thinking along with you and anchoring in your whole organization uh, onboarding everybody from, you know, logistics to the chauffeurs to, you know, the caterers to, you know, all of that should be a part of a sustainability team, for instance, because they see their best solutions from their own perspective. So if you don't engage everybody in your value chain of the events or in the society or then you don't get the right answers because we, Tara, of course, we are very brilliant people, but um, <laughs> we don't know everything. And we need to have the input from mm. those hands-on, I think. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm intrigued to hear your answer because I suppose, you know, our, our festival speaks to a demographic that includes a lot of young people and um you know i'm not sure what you what you each see exactly in your own countries but there are there's a lot of burden on young people to face the challenges ahead of us you know and there's almost this dichotomy between 
I really want to go to a music festival because it's fun. <laughs> and oh it no, climate change mm -hmm. and um, you know, in, inclusiveness and all of these rules and, and how do you kind of reconcile those things? And it, it is challenging sometimes to get people to be in the mindset of um, protect these beautiful spaces where we often are holding events and particularly to Nora's point with COVID, a, a lot more events are now looking to do large capacity outdoor settings which means they also are greenfield and a lot of infrastructure needs to be brought in and a lot of waste uh, often removed from those spaces. But it can be challenge challenging to get young people, especially in the mindset of be free and have fun and, you know, wear a crazy costume or buy all these accessories that, that are associated with music festivals and have a great time, but also reduce your impact and clean up and bring less like they're kind of different messages and and I, I inter was interested to hear answer because we have a similar philosophy which is you need to give people less choices and um, in order to make it easy for them to make the right choice so you know an, an example for us is um, we're a camping festival 90 7% of people who attend our event will be camping for three and a half days. They have to bring everything they need um, to, to shelter. Um, we obviously provide a lot of, a lot of food and, and infrastructure and toilets and entertainment and all that stuff, but they're still bringing quite a lot of things with them. Do they leave and them? We notice <laughs> also. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Correct. And <laughs> we notice people leaving stuff and, you know, there's, It's not a great cust if you just are trying to promote a brand. It's not a great customer experience if they have a beautiful weekend and see a lot of great music and it's clean everywhere. And then the moment they're going home, they just see a lot of trash everywhere. You know, yeah. that's not not a great customer experience. It's not a great sustainability outcome. And one of the ways that we um, introduce people bringing less, and I suppose this speaks to that policy: how do you scale up and and introduce like a regulatory aspect that forces the right decisions um, is we introduce more or less a tax on private cars. So if you drive your own car to the event, you need to buy a pass for $50 or so. Mm -hmm. And if, if your car has five people in it, that's, that's not a big deal for a group of young people. But if it's only got two people in it and a lot of stuff <laughs> that might get left over, it's more expensive. And then at the same time, we take the money from that tax and subsidize a bus program where people travel to the event on 50-seater buses where you can really only fit very little. So economically, you're punished for coming with a few people, having a big carbon impact for travel and bringing a lot of stuff which you might leave. And you're incentivized or benefiting from taking the, the lower carbon transport option and bringing as little as possible. So that's, that's one example. Um, I think, you know, I'd love to see scaled up in Australian government policy. Maybe you can take that one to Saudi Arabia in some way. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but, it, but it is hard. It's, it's hard yeah, yeah. to get people on, yeah. on board. Yeah. And thank you, Tara, for, um, you know, how do you balance consumerism with festival going and, And, and how do you balance that? I think this is a great segue to introduce the audience to the conversation and hear from the actual, you know, from festival goers themselves. Yeah. Nora, can um, I ask them a question? Actually, I've been yes. itching to do that. Because um, <laughs> again, I'm not one for um, festivals, so I'm not so sure about the cultural aspect of it. Because what I think is extremely important to think about is uh, how culturally acceptable are these policies and implications and regulations within a certain you know, ecosystem. Mm. Uh, I don't know if uh, festival goers sh share this sort of common culture vibe mm. Uh, mm. that crosses borders yeah. beyond, you know, uh, Saudi culture uh, versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, festival goers in Norway or in, in, in Australia. Uh, what does that look like here in the kingdom? And uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone could, could speak to that point. Any hands up and we'll get a mic towards you. Oh, there's someone in the front there that is itching too, I think. Maybe. A smile. Oh, hi, Abdurrahman. 
So, so, so. My, my question essentially simply is, is there a common culture that's shared between festival goers globally? Or do you feel that there's a different sort of subculture of festival goers in, in Saudi Arabia? Um, having worked with the, the General Entertainment Authority and the Ministry of Sports done the Dari'a season uh, two years ago, and uh, we, we, we do have that uh, culture of uh, festival goers, and uh, it can be uh, divided into entertainment, whether it's music uh, lovers or like uh, theater lovers or art or sports events, so we do, we do have that. So my question is, is it different than uh, festival goers or music lovers in Norway or in France or Not anywhere necessarily, else? Not necessarily, but the options in, in uh, foreign countries, like international countries, it's, uh, you have different kinds of events. Even the music events, you have the different types of genres. So people would go into the subcultures in, in to these uh, uh, international cities. But here in Saudi, I think we're more generic, we're uh, more uh, like one big event that can accommodate for different types of, uh, of people. First, hello. I think everyone has their own taste of uh, events and the culture events. As you can see over here in Saudi Arabia, now and like specifically in 2019 and 2021, it's more open. It's more open for all the cultures over here. It's more open to all the people, all the different kinds, as you can see. Uh, for the people who love art, like we had already the Binal Sur, and now we're going to open the Pinali for uh, specifically in Dreya. And as you can see in the soundstorm for the people who love uh, music, and they have different tastes. It's going from DJs to the normal culture like Hamai and the other people. So that's what I'm telling you, that each individual culture has their own taste. And we love to hold all the tastes over here for all the different of people and the kind of people. And thank you. Thank you. You've been patient. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's fine. Um, so, uh, I think, you know, to answer your question in terms of how it feels culturally, worldwide, I think the music culture is very um, homogenous in a lot of ways. But what differentiates, I think we have a nascent industry here that's just starting out, getting its feet wet. Um, when we go to foreign countries, like I've been in festivals out in Sweden and England and Spain, I think, in, and even Europe actually does this better from, than America in some ways, where they limit our choices. Really, speaking to Tara's point, Linnea's point, limit my choices, all right? When I go to a festival, yeah. make me get a deposit token. Make me have to bring that cup back to you to get my money back. Because when you do that to me, yeah, it puts me in a bad position. Some people might not like it, but the results are way better. You, 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 I know people don't like control, you know, we're young, we don't like to be controlled, ah, we need to be free, but that's not necessarily what we want for the future, right? Yeah. You know, as, as the youth that, that has this burden, we essentially are telling policymakers, put those policies in place, you know, mashallah, yani, when I came to Saudi, I saw so many recycling bins um, all over the city in Riyadh, that was very impressive. I'm from Kuwait, personally, we have mm. no recycling bins anywhere. Mm. So, um, you know, great job. But I really, you know, w limit our choices, give us these options, make sure these things are in our faces, put the colors out there, and honestly, yeah. we're going to follow those rules. Um, mm. I know festival goers don't necessarily like to follow all the rules, but w those are the rules we like. You know? Thank you. Brilliant. That's such a good point. And also, uh, we looked into this at Roskilde, which is in Denmark, so it's like the, the big oh, yeah, Northern famous. European festival. Like, uh, could we give incentives, like um, a free drink every time you brought, like, a bag of uh, trash? And it worked for one day. <laughs> and then they had enough drinks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then it, they didn't want that anymore. So the incentives, it's like if you have children, you understand, but if they get everything they want, it's not good. It's, it's trouble. That's interesting. Yeah. So what they did was making communities with socially, you know, they had some ambassadors, 
you know, the neighborhood women taking, like, watching you a bit, like, they, they were taking care of each other. So they found, like, actually, so it sounds um, <clears throat> a bit strange, but it's like social control, in a way, uh, makes you behave better. So if you live in a camp that is clean, uh, having some people a bit in charge, that works better than, in, like, incentives get, getting free drinks. And if you are at a clean site yeah. and understand that you can help be a part of that yeah. and understand why, you know, you have to take care of the nature because it's sparse and, and special, it's easier to get people on board. Yeah, and actually this makes me think of the word devotional. And when you look at devote and what it means, it means removing the vote and being choiceless. And it is devoting yourself to an environmental cause and removing that vote and giving that choicelessness, which actually is a positive thing. Um, and maybe we need to redefine what it is really to be free mm -hmm. and uh, not confine it to you know, a freedom of just choosing. Um, so I'm going to throw back to, to you. Hi. Um, oh. So oh. I just, um, I'm obviously not from Saudi, as you can probably tell. Um, and I've been to several concerts and venues um, back in the UK and worldwide. Um, and I have been very fortunate to attend some of the events over here in Saudi Arabia as well. And I think what you're saying um, is actually that it's very much a, a cultural awareness and a cultural change that, that has to happen here. Um, whilst that's been very much sort of drummed into us in those countries, it, you know, as you said, cult, you know, festival goers will still make their own decisions about what they choose to do and not to do, particularly somewhere like Glastonbury where it's tents left behind and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I think it's the cultural awareness in, in the country that you're trying to instill now to make people aware of, we need to recycle, we need to renew, reuse, we need to renew. So I think if you can bring that in at the base level, and as you say, you know, doing it through a microclimate of an event and then pulling it out to the wider public, I think that's a really, really amazing way of doing it. And, and what you've got going on in this country at the moment is, it's fantastic, it's you've just opened up the whole world to, to everything that's going on here, and I think it's wonderful for the next generations coming through. Much. I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a very important point. Um, because, again, cultural contextualization is extremely important. You have to have incentives that actually connect to the people or the goers to those kinds of venues and festivals. So that's why uh, I asked the questions. Thank you for very important reflections. Um, could we help us? Thank you. Can I handle it? <laughs> okay. Uh, I believe uh, it's a very tricky question, uh, though uh, the, the culture of uh, festivality is probably a subculture of our culture. So our culture is actually always has been uh, known, at least from a religious context, from many contexts, is uh, preserving the environment is into our main things. And as well, uh, hospitality. I think we have a those two have combined, you know, you cannot have a hospitality in a bad place or in a, in a, in a, in a you know, um, in an unclean place, I'd rather say. So I think you, if you combine the hospital that's always known into our Saudi main culture, everybody will say that to you. So if you go well into take the segment of, you know, fest, uh, festival goer or, uh, you know, the part of the culture, I think it will also, you can also take those two and combine them and make um, an advocation an advocation for every event, because music is, is about hom homogeneity, music about bringing people together, right? So festivals about music, about arts, it's all about loving the environment, it's all about soft emotions. So it's the best time you can actually introduce these ideas and have champions taking these ideas to the society and community. So I believe this is a very tricky question, well placed. Thank you. Um, I, we have two minutes left, so I will give the floor to Michelle and just have closing comments from the rest of our speakers. Uh, absolutely. I mean, my reflection on this, again, excuse my ignorance, because these are the limitations of what I know about festivals, but Inception or earlier uh, festivals that I'm aware of was the Woodstock, right? And that was something that came out of going out against war, about free spirits. So whatever worked for that time and for the political nature of what needed to happen at that specific point in time allowed maybe a certain degree um, lack of uh, strict rules and regulations of how people govern themselves. So while that worked for Woodstock, when you have thousands of Woodstocks globally, it starts becoming a problem, right? So it's a, it's a matter of how can you actually free 
and, and that's to you, Linnea, maybe, and, 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 and Tara, how can you actually free uh, the festival goers by taking away these unnecessary decisions, right? The most freeing experience, and, and sorry to dwell on, that we yeah. both shared with Noura as well, was this uh, quaint hotel that we went to in Scotland, where, seriously, um, the meals, you had zero decision other than what you ate and what you didn't uh, eat, what your allergies are, everything else, part of the service, was decisions made on your behalf. And I did not feel more relaxed than I did when we were there. It was just because of that, you yeah. know, freedom that you could actually fly and glide and think and imagine and, and conceive uh, that we had in those few days. But I don't know um, if you wanted to reflect on that. Tara, I would like to. Tara, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a balance that there's, there is a, a happy balance that we can strike um, between freedom and responsibility. I think true freedom always includes an aspect of responsibility. And we've never really been more aware of that during COVID where, it, where it's very much everyone's responsibility, whether you're healthy, un, you know, immunocompromised, young, old, to find a way to contribute to the world getting out of the situation. But I think it's just about making your approach to designing those policies um, cohesive. So it's always got to be a bit of the carrot and a bit of the stick. You know, we can't, we can't just be all incentive and or all disincentive and authoritarian. It's it's yeah. about making sure every policy you introduce is a mixture of both to be able to cater tactics that will address all different kinds of people because we are so diverse in, in what we respond to and, and react to. Yeah, I'm thinking like we have a really urgent matter here that we need to solve. And how do we do that? I think the answer is uh, what we all reflected upon, that we need to do it together. And we all have to play the role that we can play. And we all have to be aware of that and make ourselves aware and inform ourselves. And I think that's how we can start as well, to, to see how we can make the biggest impact from our place. Um, and that, you know, that goes for everybody, all our stakeholders, everybody around us. Thank you, thank you, Linnea. We are all responsible. And with that, I'll be closing today's session. It's been a pleasure being with you today and such a lovely um, pleasure. And I'd love to talk on and on and on, um, but we have to close. So have a lovely rest of the afternoon and um, lots of love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.